I'm Valerinda. Today I'm speaking to Julia. Julia, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're busy with at the moment? Thank you, Valerie. It's a pleasure to be here. So I run a company called Luminos, which is a full-service coaching consultancy. We offer individual and team-based coaching, as well as leadership development and facilitation. I've also recently become a certified data lead facilitator of Dr. Brene Brown's work, looking at the skill sets behind uh, courage and vulnerability. Yes, I noticed that you studied with Brene in Texas last year. What is Brene really like? I was really, really nervous to meet Brene because I've been a big fan of hers for many years. You could say stalker. <laughs> um, and I've watched all her clips and read all her books. And I've really been incorporating a lot of her concepts into the work that I've been doing for the last decade. It was a great privilege to be accepted onto the program. About 20,000 people applied and about 600 people were accepted globally. When I met her, I just realized that she is the real deal. She is authentic, she's genuine, she's hilariously funny. And more importantly, she's a woman just like us. She is running a business, she's doing her research, she's writing books, and she's also just trying to be an amazing mother and partner and juggling all those many balls and roles and she does it with great grace and great sense of humor and she really walks her talk she's not afraid to say i'm afraid and imperfect and she's really courageous so i thoroughly enjoyed meeting with her and she's been incredibly generous with her material and her team has been really really welcoming of us and I've been hearing the buzzword vulnerability for such a long time now, for a few months, and really wanting to know what is vulnerability? The official definition is that vulnerability is an emotion that we all experience during times of uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. It's not about winning or losing, but it is about having the courage to show up and uh, when you can't control or predict the outcome. And how is courage linked to vulnerability? So courage in the olden days came from a French word, cur, which means heart. And it meant speaking one's whole truth with one's whole heart, both personally and professionally. Over time, we speak about courage in the form of bravery and maybe doing very courageous, brave things, like putting one's life on the line. And while that's important, what we're really talking about here is the vulnerability it takes to putting one's whole self out into the world, both personally and professionally. You can't get to courage without rumbling with vulnerability. And what that means is that there's always gonna be that moment, possibly where you hesitate before stepping into an arena or taking a risk or having a hard conversation or you know, starting something new, which all involves massive courage, but also stepping into uncertainty, risk, and sometimes emotional um, exposure. So vulnerability and courage, they're like two sides of the same coin. You don't get one without the other. Thank you, that really explains it so well. So how do these dynamics actually play out in corporate essay? I think many of us um, feel quite disappointed in the new South Africa. And you're seeing this not only at a macro level, but certainly in organizations as well, where you're seeing very, very high levels of employee disengagement. You're seeing very, very high levels of employee unwellness, despite all the wellness centers and meditation and mindfulness <laughs> sessions that we offer. And of course, what we're seeing in an alarming um, level of statistics is big ethical breakdowns. So it's going to take an enormous amount of courage from a lot of people showing up in new ways, calling out poor behavior, calling out the lack of leadership in order to really start changing our companies, our country, and of course our communities therein. So what are the skill sets that make up courage? So the good news is that people think courage is something that you're either born with, it's part of your personality type, and that's not true at all. Courage is a skill set which can be taught, measured, and observed. In other words, everybody can learn and practice being more courageous. And there are four key skill sets which came out of a seven-year research study um, that Dr. Brene Brown did, which also backs up her 20 years of previous research around the topics of courage, vulnerability, shame, connection, empathy, emotional literacy. And those four skill sets are one, rumbling with vulnerability, which is really getting very up close and personal with the discomfort we feel when about to step into something new and brave. Two is living into our values. Now we often talk about values in very aspirational, kind of lofty ways, but this is getting very, very clear around what are those core values which, like a lantern, guide our way in the dark. The third is braving trust. And if you think about it, trust and vulnerability are like a chicken and egg. They need to be layered and stacked on top of each other. 
And to trust is one of the bravest and most vulnerable things you'll ever do, especially in the workplace. And the last one is um, learning to rise, which is a brilliant amount of skill sets around emotional literacy and knowing how to get back up again and resetting and being resilient. Because if you're gonna be brave with your life, your work, your relationships, you are gonna fall, you are gonna have setbacks, disappointment, and even failure on occasion, maybe even heartbreak. So how do you get back up again so that you can continue to be brave and do what needs doing? So what happens in the absence of courage and courageous leadership, especially in the workplace, and we're all guilty of these, is we avoid tough conversations. These are hard conversations which could be productive, giving people feedback, holding them accountable, um, calling them to task if maybe things haven't necessarily been handled the way they were committed to. And these are really, really hard, vulnerable conversations for us to have. So what happens when people avoid them, sugarcoat them, tiptoe and pussyfoot around them, is you have people talking about each other rather than to them, and you have a lowering of trust, you have a um, lowering of standards, and you certainly have a lowering of engagement and um, connection in the workplace. The second thing that shows up when there's a lack of courage is, very importantly, a lack of innovation. Because innovation in itself is about stepping into arenas, experimenting, making mistakes, and having to learn from that. And if people don't feel it's psychologically safe to speak up, to be robust, to have debates, to question, to say, why are we following this approach? Is this the best product or you know, plan for us to be going forward? If they don't feel it's safe to do that without being shut down, put down, or it being career limiting, the very least you're gonna get, or the very most you're gonna get, is groupthink and status quo. Mm -hmm. And the third thing that we tend to do when there's a lack of courage is we avoid having real conversations with our people, our stakeholders, about fears and feelings. We think if we open that big can of worms, no one's gonna work and it's all just gonna get hell of a messy. And many people are afraid to go to those conversations. But in fact, during times of change, upheaval, restructuring, uncertainty, which quite frankly is the world we live in today, it's highly complex and makes us feel very vulnerable, you need to be able to talk about those fears and feelings, otherwise you'll spend an unreasonable amount of time dealing the unproductive behavior that comes about as a result of those fears and insecurities. I'm sure a number of our viewers would like to know how to have courageous conversations. How do we go about learning to do that? So what's key is we have to talk about what vulnerability is not. And there are six myths around vulnerability. I'm just gonna to touch on two of them. One is people think that this is about weakness. And if I could give you an example of some of the situations which people have shared with me and certainly in the research around what makes them feel vulnerable, it's things like having a hard conversation, giving feedback, receiving feedback, having to retrench someone, being retrenched, saying I love you first, starting a business, putting an idea or a proposal out there and not really getting the response you wanted, waiting for the doctor's results. These are not acts of weakness. This conversation for me is an act of courage, I'm sure as it is for you. These are things we don't know about. So even sometimes not knowing something makes us feel vulnerable. But when you think about it, it's just not weakness. If you think about a time you've been brave, what role did vulnerability play? It's right there, you know, like laminated on top of each other. So the key myth is that vulnerability is not weakness, it's our ac most accurate measure of courage. The second thing is that vulnerability is not disclosure. It's not me airing all my dirty laundry and sharing all my most personal intimate details with people, especially as a leader, that's not appropriate. I have to know my role and place. And as a result, it is about being open, leaning into discomfort, being really curious, asking lots of questions, especially during times of uncertainty. But it's not about manipulating or hot wiring connection so people feel sorry for me. It sounds like this could impact the culture of an organization. How do you go about fostering a culture of daring leadership? I think first of all there needs to be a willingness to do so because we can read many, many books, there are lots of shelf help books out there, but I think the first thing is one has to get pretty clear that you're willing to step into an arena knowing it's gonna be uncomfortable. So no matter how much you practice vulnerability, this is the worst news, it's always gonna feel uncomfortable, it's always gonna feel awkward, you're always gonna have a somatic reaction to it. 
But if there is a willingness to really step in, be curious, to speak out, um, I think this is the first step. The second thing is quite practical. It's around when, where, and how do you want to have this conversation? It's not the best idea to tackle a team leader on a Friday afternoon in an open plan office before a public long weekend. It's, we're just not the, the same place. I'd also say don't have it when you're hungry, tired, or feeling ill. I'm a very different person when I'm hangry, right? So there's something around where do you choose to have this place? The third thing is, can you put yourself in the other person's shoes? Can you hold a deep curiosity and compassion for maybe what's going on for them? And very importantly, can you own your contribution? What is your part? What is the story that you've been telling yourself in this situation? And how have you actively or even passively been involved in the situation? So it's very important that we take a good look at ourselves in these scenarios. And then it's to step into that conversation, knowing that it's not going to go perfectly because it's not a script. But it's about leaning in and saying, what is, what is possible here if we want to resolve this? How do we move forward? So I'd always say to people, get clear on why do you want to have this conversation? Choose your time and place. Really get curious around what might be going on for them. Get very, very clear around what your role and contribution is. And then lean into that conversation with a whole lot of courage and a, and a whole lot of discomfort. It will pass. And then really you want to establish with the individual What's the next steps? How do we move forward? And sometimes you realize there's too much water under the bridge and you can't go forward, but how do you allow the person and yourself to step away with dignity? When we talk about daring leadership, it's important to have a definition of what is a leader. And in our book, a leader is anyone who takes responsibility for developing the potential in people and processes and has the courage to develop that potential. So this then means that all of us have a responsibility to lead and all of us have a responsibility to be courageous. So leader in this context is not always about hierarchy, status, position on an org chart. I have met some of the most courageous people who never ever sat on an exco, but they had a following, they were deeply connected with their people, they were really okay with uncertainty and they were really able to provide an amazing um, you know, direction to their people. So we all have a responsibility for driving and forming culture. So what daring leaders do is they are very comfortable with being a learner. They want to get it right versus being right and being the expert and having all the answers and having all my, my stuff together. And um, what they also do is they are very curious. They lean into situations where they're uncertain and maybe feel at risk and they ask a whole lot of questions to understand. They also model behavior that they, they want others to demonstrate during times of uncertainty. And that behavior is really calm, being very considerate, asking people how they're doing, how are they feeling, what information do they need, what does support look like. They spend a lot of time um, connecting with people. They spend a lot of time giving gold stars versus collecting gold stars. And they also know how to model rest, play, and recovery. Because we all work at a breakneck speed, but at the end of the day, sometimes people need to just celebrate small milestones and to take a little bit of a breather before putting their foot back on the pedal again. So there's a number of behaviors that um, daring leaders demonstrate. Um, especially during times of change and uncertainty, which foster a culture where it's okay to not have all the answers, to make mistakes and to get back up and out there again. So there's a lot of psychological safety and a lot of innovation in those kinds of organizations. And building on what you've previously mentioned, what gets in the way of courage in the workplace? So there was an ancient, very wise Roman called Marcus Aurelius, and he said, what stands in the way becomes the way. And what's often standing in our way the most is ourselves. And many people think that the biggest barrier to courageous leadership or being brave in one's life is fear. And while that's very evident, because courage is about being both brave and afraid at exactly the same time, the thing that's getting in the way most is our armor. And our armor is this like 200 ton 
shield that we put up, especially when we're feeling a little bit triggered, uncertain, at risk or emotionally exposed, and we kind of assemble this armor, but like a transformer in one of those movies. And some of the most popular armors, and certainly one I know that I have tried on on many occasions and have lugged around with me for many years, is needing to be the expert, needing to have all the answers, needing to get it right. Another one is hiding behind cynicism. And you'll hear this a lot in corporates, like, wow, that's a really great idea, but I don't think it's going to work here. And these are little, very subtle ways in which we don't show up, get seen, and take some brave risks. Other ways in which we armor up are using power over people versus power with or power to or, or within. And this is using my status, my privilege, my skills, my relationships, my network, my influence to keep people small. Other ways are shaming, blaming, finger pointing. And shame shows up in organizations in very, very subtle ways, but it's very, very detrimental to the health um, of an organization, makes it quite toxic. And another is zigzagging and avoiding, which is, like I've said before, we avoid a lot of the hard conversations. We, are, we avoid making some really tough, ethical decisions. And so often what I say to people is, how do, can you choose courage over comfort and the definition of integrity is doing what's right over what is fun, fast, or easy. But sometimes when we're feeling threatened, we'll armor up and just take the easy route. Well, I certainly would like to be braver in some arenas of my life. What advice would you have for me? So the fact that you're asking the question tells me that you're ripe and ready to, to step in. So I commend you on that. Um, a key question for you or anyone listening to, to think about is where am I being called to be braver? What are these different contexts, these different arenas I'm being called into? And it could be really, really small things like having a hard conversation with a colleague that hasn't been performing. It could be, you know, putting yourself out there in a new way. It could be, you know, putting your hand up to learn a new skill like public speaking or, you know, maybe even learning some of this new, you know, tech and data stuff, which everyone's quite afraid of. So this idea of where are you being asked to be braver and really getting curious about that and then thinking about what are the skills and behaviors I might need to learn to stretch myself in order to do that. The other thing I'd say to you is when you, when you are brave, You've got to know that on occasion it's not going to work. So you need to have a safe place or face or space to go to. Somebody that can dust you off and say, you know what, Valerie, that didn't work out well. Maybe you messed that up a little bit, but you're brave, you're amazing. Dust yourself off and get back out there, girl. The other thing I'd say to you is do the inner work. And we say that who we are is how we lead and how we live and how we learn and how we parent and how we mentor and how we show up. So this idea of being very aware of our blind spots, our strengths, our weaknesses is really, really important. It does matter because when we're not aware of ourselves, we let that poor behavior leak out and we play it out on other people. So self-awareness really, really does matter and it does count. And linked to that, we talk about what is a cave you fear to enter because it might hold a treasure you seek. So those topics that you kind of don't want to go to, get a little bit closer to them because you could find that that's exactly where you're needing to go to be braver.